Everyone, welcome. It's 2 p.m. So thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Julia Myers and I will be your host for this program. I'm coming to you live from the Booker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. Our education center is open now during our regular hours, just as before, Thursday through Sunday. Um, so we hope you can come out and see us sometime. We are very excited for our program today. Um, it is with Miss Barbara Walker. She's going to be doing amazing ospreys. And she is with the Tampa Bay Ras Raptor, excuse me, Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue. Um, and we always look forward to her programs. And I wanna give a big thank you to our friends group before we get started, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. They generously sponsor our program so that we can bring you this wonderful information. So if you're interested in learning more about the Friends um, or even becoming a member, you can check them out at the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve.org. And Miss Barbara Walker is going to get started shortly. Um, quickly before she does, we have a chat box at the bottom and we also have a Q&A box. So if you've got any questions throughout the program for Barbara, please put them in the Q&A box and then we will get them all to her at the end so she can answer them. And if you have a comment or a suggestion or something to let me know, then please use the chat box. And without that, I think we are ready to get started. So thank you so much for joining us, Barb. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, it is always a pleasure to um, give a program on ospreys, especially for Brooker Creek and the Friends of Brooker Creek. Um, the uh, ospreys have been a uh, total obsession of mine for quite a few years. I started out in Audubon Eagle Watch as a nest watcher, and most nest watchers will agree that, especially bald eagles, that at the end of the season, when they all leave, you get this terrible, lonely, depressed feeling. <laughs> so um, hence, it's a good time to make sure you're tuning into what the ospreys are doing. And there's so many more of them. Um, so I'm with Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue and um, it's a 501c3. I started a long time ago, but you won't get to the right website if you use Google right now. So I have our Moccasin Lake Raptor Sanctuary website down below. Um, basically, our organization does three things. We take care of the birds at Moccasin Lake Nature Park, which is a um, is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to 5. We have 14 different species. Um, we rescue birds, get them to permitted rehabbers. And, and the last thing that we do is um, work with Osprey. And here is the story of ospreys um, and uh, how they are thriving in our area. Uh, just to let you know, if you have to go, like if I've talked for an hour and you have to go, that's cool, totally cool, no worries. But this program is um, one of the ones that has the most content. Um, and there, I talk about a lot of different things here. So these are the things that we will be talking about throughout the program, not necessarily in a linear order, but the kind of the overriding um, themes of this particular program. And it does include um, the conservation management of ospreys in Pinellas County, which is the most densely populated county people-wise, but it's also highly densely populated with ospreys and so um, things that uh, we do with them here can serve as a model for other areas that um, are growing. They are protected. What is their status? They're protected. Their osprey are a global species. You, you can find them all over the world. There's um, the four different subspecies. Um, so their status can actually change from place to place. Um, they were a species of special concern down in the Keys. Um, but there's certain things that you can do and you can't do. You're not allowed to shoot them. And you're not allowed to glue them to pilings. And yes, people have done crazy things like that because they've been annoyed about droppings or noise or what have you. It used to be that in order to um, work with a nest, you had to have a permit um, either for every single nest you moved, or you would have to have a blanket permit. I had a blanket permit, so I moved a lot of nests, what we felt like was out of harm's way on the platforms. They're also called fish hawks, 
And that is because the diet of the osprey is 99% fish. And they have, take a look at the bird on the no fishing sign, and you'll see, look at those nice long legs to reach down into the water and grab fish. They really are specially adapted to fishing. There are people that tell me I saw an osprey grab a squirrel. Um, well, probably not. Um, they do grab things that are not necessarily on their diet, um, but we'll get to that. <laughs> they eat a very large variety of fish. So we made a little list of some of the most popular ones. Sometimes we'll say, we'll hear someone say they saw an osprey with a snake, but it might've been an eel. Um, but they love ladyfish and uh, needlefish and flounder. So uh, there's a variety of photos here of ospreys with their various catches. They like to eat that head off first. When they fly with their catch, they usually fly with the head first because it makes sense to do so aerodynamically. Once in a while, we'll get a call about an osprey on the ground that has been on the ground for a long time and it's because their fish is so big. Sometimes they swam out of the water with it because it was such a big catch that they couldn't lift off with it. They'll share the fish with their mates. This one gets a half a fish, one half for me, half for you. They have this wonderful ability to sort of hover over water and they do something also called roller coastering when they have a fish in their talons to attract their um, mates and kind of show off that they actually did catch something. They have terrific vision like the rest of the raptors do, probably about four times better than people do. So they're able to spot these fish in the water and dive in and get them. They can go uh, up to 100 miles an hour in a dive and uh, they go about three feet deep. Um, not, they can't really go too much further than that. What, the reason they can go as far as they can is because there's a little nasal valve that closes when they go underwater so they don't, um, so they don't drown. Um, they're about 24 inches long, which to give you an example, I was looking at this picture yesterday and it, yeah, that's about a two foot long bird. You think about the swallowtail kite and I mean, just the tail is going to be 11 to 14 inches on a swallowtail kite and it's not all that much bigger. So it's kind of interesting to see the differences in between the species. And they've got a four to six foot wingspan. They follow the um, typical pattern of other osprey, other birds of prey that exhibit reverse sexual dimorphism, which is the, the females are bigger than the males. And in ospreys, females also have some speckling on their chest. Um, it is a challenge to pick up an osprey when they spread their wings because those wings are so long, you really have to make sure you have enough room. So on, the, on their feet, they have what are called spicules. And the uh, third toe is reversible. So it swings to the back, giving them two hooks on the front and two hooks on the back. And they can, they grab the fish like that. And that is what makes them extraordinary fishermen um, is those, those hooks and that unique adaptation really puts the osprey in the classification all of their own, Pandian halitis, um, which is the um, Latin name. Uh, one of the concerns or future concerns for osprey knowing that they can only dive about three feet is what the prey base at the surface of the water will do with temperature changes. So on top of these great feet, great eyes, they have this great sharp beak. Um, they don't have a lot of feathers on their legs. Their legs are, are um, very lightly feathered. 
and the skin is very tight on the legs. As a matter of fact, I notice when I give fluids to an osprey, it can be harder sometimes to get the needle in there because they're um, so tight and muscular on their legs. They have very powerful wings and they're long wings. And the reason those wings are so long is because ospreys are a migrating species. Um, they're also a long-lived species. And uh, some of those birds can live 26 or more years. Uh, there have been some reported that have bands on them that have had that kind of a lifespan. That's raising a lot of kids over the years. On the photograph there on the right, you can see very clearly, this is a female osprey. You can see the dark speckling on the chest that's called a necklace. So we know we're looking at a female there. And those feathers have to stay nice and oily. It's somewhat of a, of a water repellent. Um, they need that because when they come out of the water, that water needs to roll off of them pretty quickly. More eating. That's a needle fish, needle nose. I remember seeing those as a kid in the water when I was little in Treasure Island. What a great big fish this one's got. See if you can see the eyes on that bird. They're kind of a yellow greenish eye. That's an adult. That's one way you can tell that that bird is an adult. And they kind of, the way they align that fish, they've usually got one leg in front of the other. So they really line up as they're flying, which is also really cool. There's um, a lot going on, not necessarily observing ospreys, which is the global species, but peregrine falcons, which is a global species. Um, and they are learning how to make new aircraft. Well, someday we might fly in that aircraft that has more control because they're literally starting to learn how to put feathers on wings, which is really neat. But the aerodynamics of birds have been studied for a long time um, to help us with flight. Now, this is called a rouse, R-O-U-S-E. I love to see the ospreys do it. It's amazing that birds can control every feather on their body. That's a lot of work just in itself, but sometimes after they get out of the water and the water is rolled off of that oily um, covering, then they will also shake it out. And it's cool to watch them do that, whether they're sitting or they're in flight. Oh, got water in my ear on that one. Got to get it out. All right. Now, Osprey, one of the interesting things about them is they have interactions with other species. Here in Pinellas, we have in excess of 400 pairs of Osprey. And um, when, you know, you're too close to a nest and you're a great, great blue heron, you might hear about it from the Osprey. So um, in this case, the Osprey literally picked up a great blue heron. He didn't hurt him either. He picked him up and he just dumped him in the water. The heron was okay, but got too close and the osprey did not like the competition. And I have heard of other interactions between these species. And it's kind of interesting because they're sharing habitat. They're sharing habitat with great blue herons. They're sharing habitat with bald eagles. And you will sometimes see in areas where there's all three species nesting very close together. It's one of the reasons this is such a great world. Now they also have confrontations with bald eagles. Um, this is out at Duke Energy Power Plant, I think. And here is a bald eagle on the left, a juvenile bald eagle uh, getting a harassment by an osprey. The reason why is because the eagles have a tendency to steal the fish that the osprey catch. Um, the photo on the right, the bald eagle that's got a pretty good hold on the feet of that osprey. Boy, oh boy, uh, hopefully he let go soon. 
because there's many times we get phone calls. I remember one in particular in Landsbrook where I got a phone call. There's an osprey in my yard. It has a broken leg. I, I looked at it when I got there and I said, where's the eagle? She said, oh, he just left. Well, that's what I figured because he had a broken leg. So um, not that all broken legs come from that, but um, certainly plenty do. Um, the other predator of a, of a osprey would be a great horned owl and they have to guard their nests at night from great horned owls and their chicks too. Look at the size difference between an osprey and a bald eagle. Bald eagles have 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in their feet. I'm sorry, they have 300. The great horned owl has 500. The osprey has less than that. He's got spicules for fish. So you get these interspecific conflicts and um, those are between species. This one kept going back and forth right in front of the bald eagle down in, I believe this is in Manatee County. Um, and they named him the fearless one. Now, what I have here is not an osprey. There are quite a few people that thought that was an osprey. And um, I, oh no, it's not. This is a juvenile red-tailed hawk. And there are some telltale clues. So one of them is yellow feet. That is definitely a clue. The juvenile ospreys have orange eyes. They don't have a belly band. What throws people off here is the tail. Juvenile ospreys have kind of a stripy looking tail and this can look like a juvenile osprey, but indeed is not. It is a red tailed hawk, a juvenile. So that's one thing is you wanna, when you're looking at them, you can tell the difference. The main thing is gonna be with an osprey, I, you always see the mask. They have conflicts with crows too, but who doesn't? And then they have conflicts with each other. These are two females approaching a nest. And that is intraspecific competition. So competition between two ospreys. They have a wide variety of nest types and locations. Ospreys being a global species, have learned to nest on just about everything. I love this particular picture because it looks like a big Z to me and I called it Zorro's nest. But they live here in an urban landscape. So what happens is they're adding materials. Their osprey are incredible, incredibly, have incredibly high site fidelity, which means they return to the same nest year after year after year. Sometimes they return to the same nest, even if they've only put one stick there and it's stick after stick after stick. Uh, in a dead tree, they're adding, adding material and the nest gets bigger and the dead tree gets weaker and eventually it collapses and then they have to find somewhere else to nest another dead tree, a live tree or something else. And in our landscape, it often becomes something else. Here's bringing a stick into a nicely developed nest. And you can see the size branch that they can carry. The size branch they can carry is different than the size that a bald eagle could carry. A bald eagle can carry a larger diameter branch. Not that ospreys are sissies because they will attempt as much as they can do. Some of them become, literally I call them the OCD birds because they just keep building and keep building. And I'm looking at this picture and here he's got this, this is a nice moderate stick. And I don't see any speckling on the chest. So I'm thinking male, but I'm looking at the eye and the eye looks like a nice, like a yellow eye, like an adult. But there's just a little bit of buffy color underneath. And that they have as chicks. So I wouldn't gauge that bird to be more than 
four or five years old at the most, because it still has what I would say some young markings. This one too, you can really see it. So this may be a three or four year old that's building a nest. They add moss to fill gaps and to line the nest. And then a lot of times they have then monk parakeets that will use a portion of their nest, sometimes up underneath it. And para parasites can be a problem. Chlamydia can be a problem if um, the nest has the monk parakeets with it. So hopefully it doesn't, but they can. And so can house sparrows. Um, there's a few others that will live off the ospreys. Hard, hard work. It is a hardworking bird. You look at that picture very closely and just look at the way the leg, the muscles in the upper leg and the way he's clenched. He's really an athlete. Um, I, I see birds as athletes of the sky because of their just amazing abilities. Here he comes with some more. Now, they can be sensitive despite the fact that they live so in such close proximity to us, um, they can be sensitive and it depends on the timing of the activity, how high the nest is, what the disposition of the bird is, the disposition of the nest is there, are they about to lay eggs, the eggs just hatch, you know, what's going on there. Um, it's hard to say, but I mean, I have a picture here. There's an osprey eating a fish and a guy at Fort DeSoto approached the bird and he has a pretty big fish he couldn't take off. So he just sat there and ate his fish. So it all depends um, on what's going on at the nest. Now, ospreys in their nest, they have habits of picking up all sorts of things. So uh, this nest is at one of the mile markers in P Largo area. And um, it's got a blue t-shirt, a pink flip flop. There's other things in there because throughout the years, I've had multiple people send me pictures of this nest in the Keys. And it's interesting to see the stuff change. If you heard a screech in the background, that was a red shouldered hawk. Anyway, if the tourists are worried about losing their clothes, they can find them up there in that nest in the Keys. Here is a picture of a nest at the YMCA in, off of Ridgemore and up in East Lake area. And that particular day, we had to replace a chick that had come out just a tad too early. And once the bucket truck operator got up there, he said, there's a newspaper in this nest. It was still in the plastic. So ospreys pick up a lot of different things and put them into their nest, and which can be dangerous. Um, I have pulled out um, a My Little Pony out of a nest, a bra out of a nest. Um, one of the bras had raptors on it. That was even more fun. And um, what you see in this photograph as well is there's a couple of fish in there. I always bring gifts when I go into an osprey nest because, uh, hey, it can't be all bad if you're bringing fish. So live pines are decreasing and the population is increasing. And this occurs over time. If we went back in time, if we went to the 70s, we'd say, wow, there aren't that many ospreys here. If I went to say 69 to 75, I've been in Pinellas County 51 years. And I grew up in the southern half and I moved up north. Now I mean North Pinellas, that's up north to me. Um, and I remember as a kid, there was only a couple pair of ospreys. I would see them. And I always looked at them and I was always fascinated by them. Um, but uh, over time, there's been many, many, many more because they, came, they went on the endangered species list and came off the endangered species list. 
They were affected by DDT that bioaccumulated. It made the eggshell too soft because of a prohibition in um, metabolizing calcium. And they would sit on the shelves, the shell crushes underneath them, and hence the population takes the dyes because the young to nest ratio is so poor. So uh, during all this time, though, uh, over then we stopped using the DDT and uh, the uh, osprey population is growing, but at the same time, the people population in Pinellas County is growing. And so we end up with birds that are um, increasingly on artificial substrates and particularly in cell phone towers. Here's a nice uh, multiple tier nest. This is in Landsbrook too. And I like the picture of this nest because it's so big. It was one of the largest, it looks smaller in the picture than it did in person, but the bird, let's put it this way. He said to himself, self, there's an old dilapidated nest. Why bother remodeling? I'll just build a new one on top of it. And he did that kind of annually. There may be some reasons for that. Um, sometimes, there are, are uh, bugs, ants, or mites, um, and he, he may have done that just to, to bury them in, too. Um, there also could be dead chicks, and they will sometimes bury a dead chick in a nest. They like what's called snags. A dead tree with a 360 view, or anything with a 360 view, is pretty attractive to an osprey. I love the pose with their wings like this, they're drying off. It's very falcony. Look at the size branch of this bird is moving around. That's probably about the biggest type of branch they would move around. That, if you can see, because that's how wide the beak actually opens to be able to pick it up and move it. Now, what else do they nest on? Ships, boats, buoys, cranes, windmills, storage tanks, billboards, chimneys, fences, lights, signs, roofs, cell phone towers. Let's add bushes, the ground, the top of your house, or anywhere, anywhere they can build. Um, they're happy to do so. They are very, uh, they're very good nest builders, and they will take advantage of a tall structure no matter where it's at, because whenever it's a tall structure, you've got a great view. Here's some fake cell phone towers. There was even a nest in that fake palm tree tower. And this is the, um, here there's an upper right, there's one of a kind of Christmas tree or a pine tree looking one. And then there's the one in the middle is the bell tower at East Lake United Methodist Church. There's a nest up there for a long, long time. I could see some other species that might like that too. Another global raptor, the barn owl. If I was a barn owl, I might look at that too. It's a pretty attractive looking house, don't you think? Cell phone towers, and you know what? It doesn't matter where on the cell phone tower. This bird picked a pretty unusual spot right behind the satellite drum there. We had a partnership for many years with American Tower and went around and checked those nests for activity so they know whether they could work on the tower or not. Because what happens is, if a tower goes out, it's a problem because the people can't dial 911. They need their phone service to work. It's a service reliability issue. So they really need to get you know, the tower service, but you have legalities with nesting birds in the tower. So I also found they were pretty good about that and helped us to participate in keeping the birds in mind. A long time ago, this is out at the Stauffer site, I believe, there's a super fun site um, up in Pasco County, and there was quite a few uh, platforms that were in need of repair. And through grants with Duke Energy, we've been able to replace and redo uh, dozens and dozens of platforms that had been installed in the 90s in the Tampa Bay area um, that were failing for a variety of reasons and um, we were able to fix those. So something like this, I look at the pole conditions, not so great, um, you know, but here's the thing, an osprey will look at that and you know what, they'll figure it out, how to build it up on the other side and it'll be straight across the top and there's this slanted dish, 
but they can do that. Um, we've moved them off of cell phone towers. This is a cell phone tower in Oldsmar. And um, luckily we were able to move a pair onto that platform off the cell phone tower. Very unusual because it's lower. And um, they did have a couple of broods back there and then they were gone, but now they're back. So we'll have to see. The unusual thing is, if you look at the photo on the lower left, you'll see the late mama cat. She was mine for five years. Um, she had a bunch of kittens under the tower. I think that there were fish scraps down there. Um, so we ended up cleaning up a cat count colony out there with Rick Shabity from Suncoast Animal League, but I adopted the mother kitten and her kitties. And um, she, you know, she unfortunately ended up with cancer when she was five and we lost her, but, um, but someone was out there feeding them because there was food out there and everything. And it was just become to be maybe a, like a, a kind of little ecosystem out there. But uh, yeah, it's possible to move the Osprey out of the cell phone tower, but your results are gonna be spotty. Um, here's a bird nesting on stadium lights. This can have a tragic end as well. Um, ideally, what we like to encourage, and we've done this largely with the city of, with Duke Energy and the city of Dunedin, um, is to retrofit um, structures that needed a platform onto them so you could actually put the platform above the light so the osprey can still live there and your lights can remain untouched osprey poop is serious stuff and it's extremely acidic and it'll even damage metal so um and this is quite a waterfall cascade of a nest here's a picture of one on a tiki hut this is Home Depot in Palm Harbor. If you see the Perkins here, if you overlook over there, that tower actually now has two platforms on it. There's two pairs of Osprey that live on that one tower. I think that might be the one that's at the highest altitude. And if a fledgling falls from there that cannot fly, forget it. The other thing that's attractive right next to it on the right is a billboard. And I can see a bird easily building a nest right there. Not just an osprey, but billboards could be attractive to barn owls too. And then you see a single light in the parking lot. And that's probably not big enough for an osprey to nest on, but not that he wouldn't try. Here's one on a satellite disc. Instead of putting the satellite tracker on the osprey, this was a little reverse on things. And this was over at Derby Lanes. And eventually that bird was relocated. But I thought that was one of the funniest ones. And you can kind of see in this picture when I showed you this slanted platform, look the flat top. You can see it now. What they would have done if they had the slat, you know, slanted platform, they just build up the other side. Doesn't mean it's a stable, but they can do it. Uh, they also build a lot of nests on power lines. This can be very dangerous for the ospreys. They can run into the lines. The nest can catch on fire. There can be power outages. The three leading causes of um, power outages are cars, wildlife, and weather. Um, so, you know, and, and for us in Florida, we get all of that, especially in Pinellas County, um, right about this time of year. So if you see any nest building on power lines, call the Duke Energy customer service number and report it. They are tracking all of that. They do a risk analysis and they even put up pole caps. If you look at the top right picture, see the black cap on top of the pole? That helps prevent nest building because things slide off and it protects them from perching there too. And then in the lower picture, you'll see there's things attached to the actual lines to make them more visible. On gray colored days, uh, the lines are harder to see and you get a higher incident of ospreys or pelicans or great blue herons hitting the power lines. So they use a variety of methods to move them. Keep in mind that power companies have millions and millions of miles 
of power lines to keep clear. It's not easy. This was one of the first nests that was on a power line that we moved together onto a platform. And you can, it took a lot of work for them to prepare this. They have to de-energize lines and they have to insulate things so that the birds and the nest can be safely retrieved. And then they put them in a new nest. And there is a lovely fiberglass dish platform, left groceries. I'm sure the parents appreciate that. And these guys ended up fledging normally. You can only move them so far. The fish and wildlife guidelines were about 300 feet. But that really varies. It really depends on the situation. It depends on the visual site. It depends on other things in the area. It depends on the height of other things in the area. So it's really a good idea to really evaluate everything very carefully first. This is the Osprey up in East Lake. Again, I live up in East Lake uh, in Pinellas County, Florida, Palm Harbor, Florida. And um, this I took um, from a building that is higher than the actual nest. So uh, and that nest right there, that's East Lake Road. Uh, and these guys manage every year. It's amazing. Um, a long time ago, <laughs> it was a little while ago, um, you would have to apply for a permit for every nest that you were going to fix or work with. I eventually just got a blanket permit so I could move things around um, based on need of the actual birds because you can't predict what bird's gonna build on what um, ahead of time. So uh, we, I had all the permits and then eventually they dropped the need to, move, to have a permit if you want to move a nest that's inactive and inactive means there's no eggs, there's no flightless young, it's off season. So um, you can move it or eliminate the nest. And in some cases it's advisable to do so. It's not exactly being mean to the bird. It's just that it could create a human wildlife conflict that is unnecessary. So you need to get all types of things together for ospreys. If you're gonna relocate them, you need the money to do so. You, you no longer need the permit, but community participation, you need permissions from property owners, you need a pole, you need a platform, you may need det other deterrents in the area, and it can be complicated. So I see that there's a lot of variables on what you're going to do. Um, utility companies have blanket permits. Um, you know, DOT, power companies, cell tower companies. So in you know, you need a lot of, be able to coordinate with a lot of different agencies if you want to move a nest. Here's an example of a nest built over a road on this type of a structure. Uh, you see these type of structures over the highway as well. Actually, this year there was a nest over 275. And um, one day it came crashing into traffic with the kid in it. And luckily that bird was rescued. And I'll show you what happened to him. And he was okay, so which is really amazing. Here's a here's a, a gorgeous, uh, beautiful, beautiful osprey that decided to build on a traffic light on Indian Rocks Bridge, and so they tried a deterrent of those spikes, and all those little spikes did was give them spots. You can see it in the bottom photo. Gave them spots to um, weave the branches in it, locked it on there. So we ended up with the Boy Scouts and the uh, City of Indian Rock Speech and Department of Transportation, a lot of different people to get this nest moved. And we did get it moved onto a platform on the side, off the side of the bridge in a little bit better of a spot. It's not easy to put in an osprey pole and platform. You need a lot of equipment. You need a truck big enough to haul a 45, 50 foot pole for one. And those poles are heavy. They use the auger and they sink the pole 10% of the pole height plus two feet. And then you need bucket trucks on top of it to mount the uh, platform, which the Boy Scouts built in this case, and it was later updated to a dish. 
and um, and of course the nesting material. So, and the birds will move over there. This was a, this was back in 2007, <laughs> all seats, seven bucks. Um, so this was on the move it go sign on US 19 in Palm Harbor. We moved this one off the sign because they had trouble changing the sign. And it was kind of low off the of busy US 19. And what I call Al Caponing it was there, Al Capone literally had a house in St. Petersburg and there was an osprey nest. It didn't no longer built, was owned by Al Capone, but there's an osprey nest on top of the uh, palm tree. And when the new owners got there, they cut the head off. So I call it Al Caponing it. Um, so that can happen. Uh, we put them up. Nice, tall platform, very tall platform. You can see that's one of the tallest ones I have, but that's good because it keeps their flight path out of US 19. And um, if you look at the picture in the upper right, the water body that you see here, that's Lake Tarpon. And that's good fishing area, especially right now, especially in times where we have red tide and ospreys can get toxicity from that red tide. That's good to know about the lake. And, you know, there's cost involved. It's probably cost me, you can do a platform that's lower and that you don't want to need a lot of equipment for. You can certainly do those for a, a much less for, for hundreds of dollars. But the big poles and the big platforms that I put in are usually, they're industrial. They're, I call them the biggest birdhouses in the world. And they're really around four, th four to $5,000 a piece um, for, for everything. And this is the um, Publix at Brooker Creek Shopping Plaza. And there was a, a, a long-term nest on the lights there. And we put a platform off to the side of the building and the birds eventually moved there. Now, there's this YMCA, there's this tricky thing here with the YMCA. Timing is also another factor that I put in to moving ospreys. And if you are not careful, if the pair is not there when you put their platform up and another pair is, they'll steal the platform and then you get to put in three platforms. <laughs> so, YMCA did end up with three platforms. One got stolen by another pair and then another pair had nested on lights there. And uh, that's about all the property will hold. Even though they have more ospreys building there, we can only continually remove any nests there and hope that they go directly across the street to the golf course. Um, there's still some suitable trees, but they need that open crown. So um, it, it's kind of tough for them to find all the space they need. This was on tennis courts lights in the beginning on the um, picture in the uh, upper left of the slide. And what was happening is when the poop got onto the tennis courts, it was also slippery. So it was unsafe for the people and uncleanly for people as well. So um, in a lot of the relocations that we've done here, these are, a variety, these are Again, why this is the third platform we put in at the YMCA. Variety of these, we will put in a perch. This one doesn't have one, but they do transfer over pretty easily, but sometimes they'll tease people and continue to drop sticks in the old location <laughs> and you have to keep them off. Um, Homeport Marina, this is in 2010. I'll never forget that year. Um, it was significant for Ospreys. Um, these guys were on the Homeport Marina sign and we moved them along the Pinellas Trail and um, they nest on boats. They can nest right over cars. And if you're a business and you have Ospreys in your parking lot, well, you can block things off if you want. That's one thing you can do is sacrifice a few spots. Because again, I told you that osprey poop is very acidic. It would not be nice to your car paint. Now, there was a lot of um, platforms like this that were old wooden platforms. We have some new, uh, these new fiberglass dishes and they're a lot bigger than you think. You drive by these 
and you're looking up in the sky and you're thinking, oh, that's so small, but it's really, if you stood it up next to you, it's tall as you are, they're five feet in diameter. This might be a three by three or a four by four older platform that then had to be replaced. But oftentimes they would fall, they fail in the corners and at the bottom where um, it meets the pole. So now we put them together a little bit differently with more supports and perches for the male ospreys to guard the nest at night, especially from the apex avian predator, the great horned owl who loves to eat osprey chicks. This is from Safety Harbor. And this nest was literally building its nest on the railroad crossing arm that comes down over Main Street. It was right after New Year's Eve that I noticed this bird and knowing it could not stay there, I contacted CSX and um, together, they were a great group. You can see the nest hovering over the guy with the orange hat. See the nest over on the signal there? Not a good spot for them. And if you look over to the left, you'll see the phone tower. That's where the bald eagles nest. I mean, this is just off Main Street here, but there you are, plenty of uh, dinosaurs in sight. And uh, that nest was moved onto a platform. This, believe it or not, on the far left is a little bush on top of the building that an osprey decided to drop a few sticks on. This bird nests in a light pole. And this was in the Largo area. And there was a fair there. And you can see that the Ferris wheel was getting ready to roll. And an elementary school that watches this nest from the corner noticed the Ferris wheel. And they felt that the birds were bothered. So we had FWC check and he had the man start up the Ferris wheel. And as soon as he did, the birds got very upset. So they had to nix the Ferris wheel that year. Either that or they got to unbuild that thing and put it up. I wouldn't even want to consider building a structure like that. But, uh, and of course, if it was still and it sat there long enough, you know where the osprey nest would be. <laughs> You can probably guess where the osprey nest is in this picture. This is the Fort of Tampa and an osprey built on an unused crane. It had been still for too long. This was, and this is an osprey egg that came out of a nest. This is the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey and that's Samantha, who's an amazing rehabilitator here in Florida. She's labeling each egg. There are brown speckled eggs. Hatch. You can see the mass from the very beginning. You can see the mass. And this chick is so young, he's still got an egg tooth. It's a little white spot right here. I think you can see that. Now these birds are mating and raising young all the time uh, during during breeding season. Look at this stick. I put this in here for a reason. Um, I'm gonna show you why that is a bad position, basically. Uh, but they uh, the ospreys mate for life and they come back. I told you they have high nest site fidelity. They come back year after year to the same nest. And they pair bond. They fly synchronously, they sit close together, they watch the sunset. Eventually it leads to copulation. And more copulation and eventually eggs. And the osprey will lay <laughs> one to three, two to four. To lay all the many eggs he wants to lay, all right? There are nests that have four chicks in them. So you could get up to four, we know for sure. Um, but they incubate 35 to 42 days. And the, the more nests, the more eggs you have, the longer it's going to go. They don't always hatch at once. So you could be having a female that's 
kind of still keeping a brand new chick warm and still incubating an egg at the same time. So that's the brooding period. And the osprey returned to Florida, oh, you know, as early as October. Um, there's an early phase and a late phase, and it kind of varies on north to south um, as far as timing goes to the raptors further south of us seem to nest a little bit earlier. Um, and then uh, inland, they nest a little bit later. So it's kind of interesting. And ospreys at this particular latitude are partially migratory. What does that mean? They migrate half the way? No, some of them migrate, some of them don't. We'll talk some more about that shortly. Oh, what a beautiful bird that bird is. You can really see the necklace on this particular osprey and look how they tuck their feet in and look how perfect that bird is, every feather in place. What a gorgeous female. Now this bird looks a little different than some of the others because of the white tips at the end of the dark feather, at the individual feathers. That's modeling, and that means you're looking at a juvenile osprey. And this bird also has more of an orangey in its eye. So that's another way we could tell it's a juvenile. Here's an adult female. And here's the eyes on another adult female. I think I caught this bird, if I remember correctly, but look, that. Ospreys eat like 99% fish, but you can usually see a bulge in the neck right about here. That's the crop. You can see how starved this bird really was. He's a little cross-eyed too. I've heard the males describe this being googly-eyed, but this is a female. Sometimes you can recognize an individual osprey just by an eye fleck. So it depends how observant you are. They sit in palm trees. This is taken down at Save Our Seabirds. They have a great osprey pen down there. We take ospreys to them sometimes too. But all in the end, it's all love and they should get their eggs going and their chicks going by January. Is what the eggs look like in the nest. Now the chick is hard to spot here and I think you can see my pointer but here's one. Here's another one over here and there's some fish in there too. So these guys went from being displaced to being put on a platform. That's a great photograph of a mother with the two kids. You can see the goose flesh on the neck of that bird. But look at that eye mask. It's a little bit different. I call it a mask. It's a little bit different than what you'd see on a peregrine falcon. A peregrine falcon would come straight down. It's called a malar bar or malar stripe. But on a Osprey, it's their mask. The mothers and the fathers will shave their chicks and feed their chicks, protect them from any perceived threats. Here's a great group of chicks looking over, it looks like a Crystal Beach area. And here's one of the platforms that has several young ospreys in it. You can see the comparison in this. This wing has no modeling. This wing does, this one does, and this one on the far right does. You can really see the difference between those birds. Here too. And once again, a nice full nest. 
And oh, look at that. One, two, three, four chicks in one nest at Fort DeSoto. And that is a highly productive nest. And they all fledged too. Now, as these kids grow up and learn, they hop, they flap, they almost hover a little bit. We call that winger sizing, but what they're really doing is they're building their muscles. And honestly, by the time they're 40 days old, they should feed themselves. They fly between eight and 11 weeks. Some of them are slower than others. And sometimes you see um, one more developed than the other one, and there's a gap. It could have been a first egg hatch and a third egg, egg hatch. It could have been a first and a fourth egg hatch, all things considered. Unless you look in the nest, you wouldn't know. So size differences do occur. Um, but these guys get independent fairly quickly. Their first flights are, are usually all right, and they need some habitat around their nests for fledging. It's not easy to fledge into an um, uh, intersection with power lines and traffic lights, but this chick did it. Um, it didn't stay up there for long, but, um, and this nest was indeed moved. But nevertheless, it's not easy to make your first flight, and it takes some, some, guts and some of them are I think frightened to fly out of the nest right away they're not ready and sometimes it's because up underneath their wings or their tail their feather may be fully in but the sheath may not have come off so it needs more time for grooming and to get that keratin sheath off here's five which way do I go it's great when they can use the nest as a landing platform to eat after they've learned to fly. They still need a spot that's safe to come back and eat. Now, first landings, eh, those are different than first flights. This is probably a pretty shaky landing because he doesn't have a lot of support there. That might be a little bit better. And this one's just bizarre. Now, that's my friend Marina. And her friend, Mike McCarthy, took this picture. They were monitoring an osprey nest down south of here. And uh, I always looked at that picture and I always thought, boy, that bird, it sure looks different. It sure looks different than the other ospreys. Why? It is different. That is a different subspecies. It is a Ridgeway osprey. There must have been some Caribbean genes uh, in the pool, but this bird is definitely a different subspecies. Uh, FWC did a study at different latitudes. We gathered feathers for them from ospreys. Um, they checked for genetic differences, but they didn't actually find a genetic difference between the Southern Florida population and the Northern. But we do know for a fact that there's Caribbean genes mixed in because there's proof right here with this lovely bird. You see how white that bird is? It'll barely get an eye stripe and not much more at the top of the head. And the modeling is heavier. It outlines the entire feather uh, up at, uh, up in the wrist region, which this, this is the wrist. Um, it's very heavily modeled and in some areas, the white goes all the way around the feather. So they really have a, a really terrific uh, difference in them. And it just was remarkable that this bird happened to land on Marina's head. She had a couple puncture wounds. It's not fun. Um, this bird was flying, flying. I guess he's just all pooped out. But when an osprey makes a slice or a poop, it is significant, I will tell you that. And this is a nice young female that's flying. Um, they will, I told you this already, they continue to use this as a platform, but they can bump their wings on things. When you look at a young osprey, like the one in this picture right here, there's probably no time in this bird's life that its feathers will be more perfect 
than they are right now. And it's just admirable to look at the perfection of that bird. There are studies on osprey populations and their migration. You can look at ospreytracks.com, which is Dr. Beauregard's site. Dr. Beauregard did um, satellite tracking of ospreys for a little over 10 years. And he worked a lot in the, um, in the Cape Cod area and a lot of the Northeastern areas of ospreys that were migrating and they migrate some of them come to Florida and overwinter in Florida. Well, Audubon has this fantastic Christmas bird count that we hope everybody will go and do. But if you are counting ospreys at the Christmas bird count, you might be counting some from up north. You're not necessarily counting the breeding population, which it, you have to count nest by nest. And in Pinellas, the only way we could probably do that uh, well is from an airplane because there's just that much ground to cover or to section it off and count to try and count every nest. A lot of the nests are on private property and might be in an area where you can't see. In Michigan, they've done some really great work in the Midwest with ospreys and then there's ospreys.org at UK. I told you earlier that ospreys at this latitude are partially migratory. And over the years, this has expanded. Look at where we were in 1977. Look at where we were in 2009. That's a huge, this is Christmas bird count data that we're looking at, okay? I tracked it and put it all in there. Um, I'm gonna do an update. I'm interested to see what happens when we get to 2020 and add the next decade. Um, but I suspect it's it's grown again, um, and it's grown through these artificial structures that they're nesting on. Now, birds that have satellite trackers on them will pass through Florida during migration. And just like a peregrine falcon, you may need a rest, and you can stop in any old woodlot and take a rest. But if you if you stop in the wrong one, you could succumb to a great horned owl or uh, any other problem you might have. So over the years, we've actually um, gotten two or three of Dr. Beauregard's tracked birds that came down in Florida, and we were able to get the satellite trackers back to him to use on other birds. Sometimes there's not much left of the bird. Look at how long from the wrist down those osprey feathers are so long, long primaries. There was a study in Florida of these partially migrating birds that we have here. And about half of them go to South America and about half of them just stay in Florida and a couple of them don't even leave their nest site. So it would be very interesting to do another study like this to see if anything has changed. In order to do that, we have to have bands and satellite trackers. Mostly what has been involved is urban osprey management and conservation and all of these things. So um, everybody can help with this. There's this great website called www.osprey-watch.org. And you can enter your osprey nest into that global database and you can add pictures and notes and all sorts of things. So I like to encourage people to check that out. You know, ospreys get hurt all the time. They need to be rescued, repaired, rehabilitated, reconditioned and released. There's a lot of places that they can go. And even despite that, we still run out of room. There are so many, we still run out of room and they get backed up on ospreys. The rehabbers really need contributions to flight cages, but there is another solution. And I'll, I'll cover that when we get there. Um, it's coming up. First of all, I call this osprey overload syndrome. It's when there's, the ospreys just come in one after the other, after the other, after the other. I mean, you could get, you could get throughout all the various organizations, um, 
Nancy Murrah's organization, Chris Porter's or the, the sanctuary, how many ospreys they get at this time of year, um, you could easily, they could be picking up 10, 15 birds each a month and easily have they come up with 30 or 40 birds and have a lack of flight cage space. And the only way you can get them to a big flight cage is if you get all the way to um, the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey. You can also creons fly them, which would be putting equipment on them and actually physically exercising them. But they could also use a hacking tower. Um, I have a picture, some pictures of that. Um, the proposal that I'm making is that we begin to band and satellite track some of our birds from Fort DeSoto. We have seven platforms there and we'd like to partner with various organizations for that. We have inclusion for college students from Eckerd College and we can track the recoveries, the nesting and the important usage areas for them along with their migratory habits. It could serve as a model from all the way from Lee County down to Fernando, um, up to Hernando, and it could give us um, instead of you know the big, we know that Lake Okeechobee is important. We know that Blue Lake is important for osprey, but when we look in smaller areas, which lake is the most important? What are they using the most? And we could get micro information on how they're using um, the the areas and provide that information to city planners um, to help reduce wildlife conflicts. So that is the proposal that we're putting forth. We have been fostering uh, for Owl's Nest Sanctuary and for the Seabird Sanctuary and for the Raptor Center, fostering some of the ospreys back into some of the platforms that we've put up. And there's this one lovely little platform that we put up at Fort DeSoto uh, a couple of years ago, and the pair was trying to nest on, there's not many tall trees left at Fort DeSoto, but yet there's a huge osprey population left at Fort DeSoto. So um, we put up platforms, and um, one pair was trying to nest on something that wasn't quite strong enough to hold it. So we put this pair on a platform, and um, that pair has be, turned out to be wonderful. Um, for fostering chicks in. So uh, the first chick came, I think, from Nancy. And we put that bird up there and with uh, another bird. And the first thing that the mother did was put her arm over, her, not her arm, okay, her wing over, you know, to shade the bird. And it was a very nurturing moment. Um, and then the other kid in the nest literally handed the new bird a piece of fish. And it was like, oh, that's gonna work. Cause I left a lot of fish up there. I took a lot of presents. So they thought probably, hey, the new kid came with all this food. All right, he can't be that bad. And you can see he was nowhere near uh, being ready to go out on his own. And neither was the one in the upper left-hand corner. That one, uh, I'm not sure it, it, that one came from, that one came from Owl's Nest and they had to remove that chick from a uh, traffic light in Clearwater. And although it was much smaller, um, I value had already been up in the bucket truck. We'd already seen what was in the nest. And we'd also witnessed the behavior of this pair. And we made the behavior-based decision to put the smaller chick in the nest. And he just fledged. It, uh, it was the right nest for that bird. Um, in order to re-nest a chick, you need a bucket truck, you need the bird, a bird handler, and you definitely need a hard hat. Ospreys can become very defensive. They don't usually attack, but they do sometimes and it doesn't feel good. So, um, you know, going up protected is helpful <laughs> whenever possible. And that's Farrell uh, Thomas from Eckerd College that we sent up with the chip. This is the chick that I told you about earlier that had been nesting, had been, you know, literally hatched on a sign over 275 and, you know, the nest crashed into traffic. Um, so we put this chick in a tree nest that is out in Dunedin and they did very well and fledged also. 
So that was a really good batch. But talk about going from 275 to a view of Honeymoon Island. I have said I might be a good Osprey realtor someday. I was on this day. This is the foster mom at Fort DeSoto. I give her mother of the year award. Now that chick could stand up and you can see he's still got down on him where there's more feathers on the other. So I know it was a little concerning at first for everybody, but the photograph, he, he could stand up. His behavior matched the behavior of the other two chicks. So again, I, I went on behavior on it because it just worked this time. Normally we pick the same ones. Now, there are some videos of this that I'm happy to show you. I think I think I got to remember how to do this. Control click. Let me see if I can bring up some videos. I might have to go out of the program and back in, but I think you'd like to see them. There we go. Barb, are you seeing the YouTube videos on your screen? Can you see it? We're not seeing it. It might be, if you have a couple screens, it might be on a different screen. So we can. I will launch those on our Moccasin Lake Raptor site. So you can see them online later. Perfect. It won't be hard to see. It might not be possible. I, I've done that before with the YouTube. So, uh, but I guess I should. I can also email the links out to the participants too to watch. Okay. Thank you. I'll close that. It's making noise. There we go. So, um, the Ford families. Yeah, that's it. The Ford families were are very, very successful. This is Fleck and Jules, and that's the one that had the four kids. So I'm just saying they're perfectly capable of raising four chicks, at least at Fort DeSoto they are. And I know Center uh, Audubon Center for Birds of Prey is looking at a nest that had four chicks on it. Now, one of the things we can do with the Osprey chicks, once they come in and they, they cannot, they, they can be too old to actually put back up into a nest because at that point you might cause the other chicks that are in there to pre-fledge and you're, that's the problem you're trying to avoid. So my proposal is that we use a hacking tower at Fort DeSoto or we have a couple of other locations in mind that might work that could even serve as a model uh, for, for uh, other areas along the Gulf Coast of Florida. Uh, they use hacking towers for bald eagles. You can use them. They've been using them in the Midwest to um, actually increase the population of ospreys because they're still making a comeback there. So these, this is what it basically a hack tower looks like. And it opens up so the birds can fly in and out and you can still provide food as they learn the ropes. The type of tower I'm wanting to build would have basically one, two, three, four mews for ospreys and a center section where you could weigh and measure the birds. During off season, this would also have a balcony. And one of the things that has been done successfully in other areas would be uh, hawk watches and to count numbers of migrants that come over. So um, that would be another kind of a bonus of the tower. It, you could use it for more than just teaching ospreys, giving ospreys a, a gym, so to speak, to work out and learn how to fly without the confines of a flight cage, without a trip all the way to a flight cage to fledge naturally in the wild. Um, and uh, that is basically it would be manned by volunteers and target perches would be installed. And uh, it would be something that might be a good uh, way to band. They're the right age for banding and for satellite tracking. So you'd have the birds captured already and just be adding their equipment 
Um, so that is their proposal at this time. You can also use it as a lookout for migrating shorebirds and, um, and other things. It would be a very, really, really cool structure. Um, blood testing and toxicity research and feather condition and DNA research is still needed on ospreys. To the right, you'll see an osprey. If you look at that feathering on this bird, it is so bleached. It is so bleached. Now this bird is in rehab and it's one of the ones that came in this bleached that actually lived. Most of them that I see in this condition die. Their feather condition is so poor and so frayed. But then looking at this bird's beak and its feet, it doesn't look like an old, old bird to me. He doesn't have enough scars. He just doesn't. And he's living long enough to molt where we can look at the feathers and we can see the dark feathers coming in. But it's very unusual that they immediately are going light. They're coming in dark and immediately going light. My question is why? So that would be another area of research that we'd like to expand into. The feather bleaching and fringing is just crazy. They're brittle and they don't have their, they're not waterproof. They're dry and brittle. And back of my head says, well, what about the Corexit from 2010 that went into the Gulf of Mexico for the oil spill? Could that have anything to do with it? I don't know, but it sure would be great to find out. There are threats to ospreys that go way beyond feather condition and trauma. Dimin diminishing habitat and mortality causes are great. Um, the scariest thing probably is the amount of land that's gonna be developed. So when I talk about here in Pinellas County, we really did put together a very comprehensive plan on managing ospreys and identifying their problems. Um, and, and, and we're pretty built out. We're gonna get a lot more built out. If you look on the right, you'll see that. Um, but all those other cities and all those other places in Central Florida where the bulk of the ospreys and the eagles are, they will need to know how to manage ospreys the same way we managed them here. So hopefully we have a model and we can put out information throughout Florida to all the city planners and to the various municipalities to help them manage them in a way that it's good for the people and good for the birds. I always am looking for win, win, win. That's always helpful. Here's an osprey in the East Lake. He's sitting there on the traffic light, not such a great place to sit. They get hit by cars a lot. Um, if you find a bird that has some sort of trauma, you can call Wildlife Alert 888-404-3922 and they'll give you the name and number of the rehabber nearest to you. You can call for rescue. This is an old picture. I've been working with these birds a long time. This is from 2008. And um, sometimes they are so skinny that you can't save them. If their protein level is too low, um, there's nothing you can do um, to save them. They are already gone. Um, this bird was severely emaciated. Um, and that's an indication of carrying capacity and having as many ospreys as you might be able to have. They get hung up on power lines. Their toenail gets stuck sometimes. We had a call yesterday morning at 6 a.m. One bird got its toenail stuck on a light. Duke Energy got, got out there quickly and got the bird down. It went to the seaside seabird sanctuary to recover. This bird was just not well. We never caught it. This is an electrocution. It was a bad one. This was hit by car, February 19th of 2010. That's Susan Miller. She's now with Owl's Nest. This is when she was still with the sanctuary. Um, but this bird had a broken wing and had to be euthanized because some things you just can't fix. 
They get hit by cars a lot. It's pretty sad. This is great horned owl. This bird found under great horned owl nest could have been the problem. That was Fort DeSoto. This bird has fishing line attached to him. Not good, he's flighted, so good luck catching him. There are ways, but it would really, really take some doing and you'd have to know where he went. This bird was shot. Here are some birds being treated. You can see the pellets. We had a situation in Shore Acres where we had seven or eight osprey shot over a period of years. And that was pretty sad and it was pretty upsetting. I think these are all taken at Bush Gardens. Wrap the talons so they don't grab you or hold them very well. Sometimes they're symbolized in ospreys if there's more than, it doesn't matter. There could just be two birds in there. That's all it takes, two to tango. One doesn't like the other one. They kick it out and if they lay on the ground long enough without being noticed, then they too will perish was from 2011. This is an osprey that was just landed on top of a car, probably just learning to fly. Here's one that we saved and were able to release back at the capture location at the Tarpon Springs Yacht Club. This was an impalement. That's a lightning rod. You see these at ball fields. There are caps that you can put on top of those sharp uh, lightning rods that will prevent impalement. This was in Safety Harbor. And by the way, Safety Harbor worked with us wonderfully to solve this problem. Um, and, you know, it has not happened again because all of the all of the lightning rods were capped, but they were everywhere. But when I get an osprey with kind of a hole in the wing right there, it looked like an impalement issue. You can kind of tell. Remember the picture I had it in there twice of the bird with the branch? right under the wing, that's why I had it in there. See this one, it's very similar. That's all it takes. And if you've got a bird that's learning, this, this was inside the nest, in the middle of the nest. So if you've got birds that are hopping, flapping, wing sizing, and hovering, they can come right down on it. Very dangerous. And that's in the upper left-hand corner, that's the picture of those caps that we use to cap those off. Uh, Little tornadoes, gusnadoes can twist these down. This was one that an old one that was falling in Dunedin. And we managed to get the parents were absolutely panicked. They knew the nest was sliding and they didn't have time to build it up. This was something that happened with the chicks in it. So it, we managed to get them upright again. That's out in Dunedin. That was a cute little family. Look at the size of those keys on the table and the size of this little chick. He was re-nested. This one had a condition called scissor beak. This is a different bird. And um, there wasn't anything they could do with that one because he had scissor beak. That's when the lower mandible and the upper mandible don't meet properly and with, it, it can even grow together so that they can't open their mouth. That would be an awful death. You can really see it in this picture. And that might've been why he got kicked out. Here's one re-nested. Re That's a good old friend of mine. Her name was Barb O'Brien. Well, she used to be with Suncoast Seabird and picked up a lot of ospreys in her time. This was one of them. And we got that one back, but look at how they change from down and they don't have a lot of down. Eagles have a lot of down, but they change them down and grow into the feathers slowly. But you can see the modeling on that small chick. This is Barb Sudo. She was the rehabber and one of the best rehabbers in the country that we re-nested a chick over at Cobb's Landing. So if they do get, if a nest falls during a storm and the chick's okay, we can put them back sometimes with a small platform and that works really well. This was at the TV station in St. P on Dandy. And uh, this was another impalement, different type of uh, structure. It was an impalement entanglement kind of thing. 
and way up high. So it gave us a serious, and, and it had set all of the ospreys in the area because there was five or six of them flying around this bird. Believe it or not, we got Atlas Solutions, a uh, cell tower company in Bradenton came out and they helped us get that bird down. They came out on a Sunday and it was really nice of them. I can't believe I found them. It was a stroke of luck. And when the guy came down, he showed us the osprey tattoo on his back. So he came because he loves ospreys. So I could really appreciate that. And um, the bird's leg actually was fit. Sometimes that nest falls and the bird doesn't survive. But there's nothing you can do about that. Um, or eggs break. Now, this is Audubon Center for Birds of Prey. And this is an osprey that fell over, that flew over a methane burner. And that's why all of its feathers are burned. On that type of situation, it takes a long time to regrow back all those feathers. So that's a bird that could be in captivity for a long time. It's better to cap those methane burners. Here's a broken leg. It's quite swollen. Some more birds, some more ospreys collected and treated over the years at various locations. This one came from one of the ball fields off of the lights at the stadium. This is Derby Lanes. One night we got a, a call about one of these nests burst into flames. A light it was hot and it had been left on all night. There were eggs, but no chicks in the nest. Um, but it did, it burned up. And there's the osprey up upper left flying around there, quite panicked. A lot of work went into that. What happened in the flaming tower there, the birds made it on the tower the next day uh, because their hormones were still going. You can help ospreys by continuing to identify problems that they're experiencing and report them to us um, and identify opportunities to improve habitat and to educate people about this very important bird. There are other considerations. There could be more oil spills. Wind turbines, of course, uh, on migratory flight paths are bad for birds of prey, but there's a lot of new stuff coming out on that that really is helping the impact, like it has a motion sensor and stops. Um, and, and climate change could truly affect osprey populations um, in a variety of different ways. Public programs are always great, and we do school partnerships. There are cams out there. We used to have a cam in Dunedin, but the cam kept breaking, and it became like, yeah, not even worth it. Um, but doing banding and global studies are very helpful. Um, the, these ospreys in Dunedin that we had, this, this site is no longer active, just so you know, but they were typical early nesters. And we monitored them from ground and we banded some of the chicks as they, uh, as they came out of the nest. Uh, and uh, some of them uh, fledged. Uh, one of them, we recovered a dead bird banded. It was one of the Dunedin birds after one of the tropical storms that had succumbed to emaciation because it couldn't hunt during the storm. Here's a little picture of what was the Dunedin Osprey cam. And I meant to put a slide in here, it didn't, but if you look at the, uh, there is one now in St. Petersburg, it's the Achieva. And you go onto a YouTube and, and type in Achieva Osprey Nest Cam, it'll bring it up. They're about done now, the last bird should have fledged. But um, if you wanna watch them, there's a variety. There's a lot of Osprey nests on cams, eagles too, falcons too. This is uh, Dr. Gabe Vargo who did the banding. He was a sub permittee for banding. So he was able to ban some of the birds and do some measurements on them. It's a silver US fish and wildlife band. The man on the left's name is Tony Stuffer. 
In the middle is Patrick Stepper, his son, and on the right, my daughter, who is now driving, um, Lonnie Walker. And um, I just love the picture of these two young children looking that close up at an osprey. Tony Steffer did a lot of banding, not just uh, in this area, but uh, he did a study of bald eagles in, uh, and did a lot of work here at Lake Seminole and Lake Tarpon areas. So um, it was great that we had those guys around to do some banding. Um, we have platforms at school. There's one at Cypress Woods Elementary. And there's one at Odessa Elementary. So it's great to have students be able to watch these. And in these instances, the Ospreys also thought it might be great to nest right at the bus circle, which is really a bad idea. And what a view we gave them. All right. Um, I always like to thank all the people that gave me their great pictures to bring these programs out to you, the public. And uh, I want to say thank you very much for participating in the Osprey program. And I'm open to any questions that you might have. I really appreciate your time and listening to me rant on about Ospreys for this long. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them at this time. Thank you so much, Barb. That was wonderful and so informative. Um, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we do have one here. Let's see. Oh, thank you very much for participating oh. in the Osprey. Sorry, I'm checking the Facebook um, questions as well. That here we go. Okay. What is the policy when a nest is in a hazardous dead tree, um, or if the tree has pine borer near a home and it must come down? Yeah. So if you if it's inactive, you can just take it down. You don't need a permit anymore. Okay. Um, but if it's active and you think the tree is going to fall, then um, you're going to want to get. You have to have a special permit from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. It's a federal. It becomes federal once it's active, and they don't. So do it when it's not active, not there. When they're not there. Okay. And if it is active, you need to contact FWC. Yes, you do. Okay. Wonderful. Good to know. Thank you. Yep. And let's see here. Um, how many hatches per year do they have? The, um, one to three. Um, but as you saw in the program, some are more active than others. So we have four in some nests. And then, you know, and it could vary too. You have some partners that have been together a long time. And then you have new pairs that start starter nests that may only successfully raise one their first second year so it'll vary a little bit but it's typical to see anywhere from one to three ospreys in a nest wonderful and um as far as the population that our county supports would it be able if if the osprey population grows would it be able to support more or are we kind of maxed out here so i i love that's a great question all right so we live in here in pinellas you know, we have Tampa Bay, Gulf of Mexico, Lake Memory, Lake Seminole, Lake Tarpon, and Cloat River. So we have a very rich fishing area for ospreys. The shortages really come when it comes to nesting structures. And that's why the nesting structures at Fort DeSoto. Um, and yeah, can we support them? Not, probably not nest-wise. Um, what about mid out mid-county starts or a little bit of a rarer habitat. It's called the Brooksville Ridge and it heads, it, it, it starts mid Pinellas County and it heads up to the Brooksville area. And what it is, it's a coastal longleaf pine forest. And, you know, pine bark beetles and um, development create less habitat, you know, for the, the birds. So, you find that they're nesting more on chimneys and this and that. So if you, you know, what we'll probably find is carrying capacity, it'll kind of plateau off. If there were more ospreys, then they're going to be nesting on our houses and on short trees because the space up high is full. Got it. Thank you. Great. Yeah, you're welcome. And, if, and that's the thing is, if you watch and you see an osprey nesting on a five foot 
push, you know, um, give us a call. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, someone said that they see ospreys in Vermont during the summer. Are those migrants? Yes. Okay. Very good. And how many well, times? Most of the birds in the Northeast nest in the Northeast and then migrate and then go back up. And you can have some that stay. I mean, they can't fish. On, just what you got to know is they won't be there if ponds are frozen because they can't live where, where ponds are frozen mm. because you can't dive in for a fish. There was a, a bird that was satellite tracked that went north instead of south. And it went up into the Midwest somewhere and it was getting a cold spell and everybody was just pins and needles about that bird. And you know what, it figured it out, it turned around, it went south and it got shot. So yeah, um, you know what? It's a real gamble out there for these birds. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many times a year do they have a nest? Uh, it says nest full, but I think it means nest fail. I, mean, I, I think maybe what that means is that they will have one nest a year, one clutch a year. It's odd for ospreys to re-clutch, not that they can't, because I'm sure that if it's early in the season and it's a mature pair and say um, there's a freak storm and their eggs rolled out, they might they might lay more eggs, but they're in a nest once a year and raise one group a year of birds and then move on, then move on to hunting grounds and well, fishing grounds, really fishing and, you know, do whatever they're going to do. But that's where my big question is, well, what are they doing at this latitude? Um, so I, I would like to know, I think there's further study warranted um, and we have this perfect population put in to uh, track what those birds are doing. Great, thank you. And um, what are some of the best nonprofits to support locally? Do you recommend any? All of them. Um, yeah. We're all working really, really hard. Um, there are so many birds in Pinellas County, not just ospreys, but there's so many birds here. It's like you come into the Tampa airport, okay? And there's like these birds everywhere. You go somewhere else and you're driving forever and you're looking around and you're looking around and you're like, where's the bird? Oh, one crow and a vulture. Um, because, you know, there are, because we have so many birds here. So you got the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary, you got Owl's Nest, you got Raptor Care Center, you got us, the Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue. We're, we go under, not to just for not confusion, Moxon Lake Raptor Sanctuary, because we have, uh, we, like I said, we don't rehabilitate the birds here, but we'll get them to rehab. But we all, we maintain a permanent, birds that require permanent care for the rest of their life. And, all, and their long-lived species to boot. So it wasn't a small commitment. <laughs> yeah, we're very lucky to have so many wonderful organizations doing such great work here. Tampa Bay Watch, you got the Friends of Brooker Creek, you got just anybody that can be generous to, to, to both groups, please pick your favorite and do it because we all need it. And uh, there's just no shortage, it, you know, the rehabs this year with the drought were overflowing and had to say, I'm sorry, we, yeah, I know you've got a bird, but we can't take it. We have nowhere else left to put it. So, um, yeah, yeah, they need all the help and bird food, like, especially for raptors, it's not totally cheap. Right. Um, you know how hard it is to find a whole fish? Oh gosh, if you're a fisherman and you're on here, oh, we'll take donated fish anytime. <laughs> and um, I'm sure other places would too. Um, it's something that's very needed. Thank you. Um, yep. We've got one more question. What is the best way for um, everyone to contact you? Okay, so through our website, um, moccasinlakeraptorsanctuary.org. Okay. And um, yeah, that's the best, uh, that's, unless it's a rescue, if it's a rescue, um, I help you have a pen. My number is seven, two, seven. It sounded like a robot. Seven, nine, eight, two, three, eight, 
five. And that number is also on that website. It's on the website. It's on the website. Yeah, Perfect. Funny that you can go to the website and my number is on there and feel free to call me. Wonderful. I just stuck it in the chat as well if anyone wants yeah. to. Yeah. Oh, thanks, it. Julia. Yeah. I, I keep my my permit. Um, it's a rescue permit. Um, and I'm a sub permittee for Penny Dome, who is a, a retired school teacher now. Um, she's in St. Pete, and I've been working with her for about 10 years, and I help her with a lot of her birds. Wonderful. Well, that is all we have for today. I can't thank you Great. enough for giving so much of your time and sharing your expertise with our visitors. We very much appreciate it. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Yeah, thanks. Um, and we look to forward to doing some in-person programs with you in the near future. Sure do. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Happy flying. <laughs>